The topic I'll be discussing today is the Sino-Japanese conflict implications for the U.S. And uh, the basic point uh, that I'm going to focus on in this presentation is that it's, it's really about politics. And <clears throat> I'm only going to uh, focus today on the international dimension of politics. I could talk about the domestic uh, dimensions of politics on the Chinese and the Japanese sides, and we can get into that in the Q&A if you like. But uh, because time is short and there's only so much I can do in one presentation like this, I decided to focus just on the international dimension of, of, the, uh, of politics and how it drives Sino-Japanese conflict today. Now you'll see here uh, uh, this image of, of rising Chinese power. Uh, now we could argue amongst ourselves about whether or not China really is a great power today. But uh, I think the regime is, is projecting itself as a great power to its own people and to the world. Uh, so let's just take it at its word and call it a great power. You see here on the deck, uh, sailors are standing in formation. Jun uh, Guomang, Chiang Jun Meng. There's an equivalency here. Uh, China as, a, as, as a, the Chinese dream and the dream of military power. On the fan tail here, you see these two planes, they're J-20s. This is their new stealth, supposedly carry-based uh, stealth, stealth fighter. This was prominently played in the Chinese media. Now, one of the things that uh, China points to, uh, to to make its case is that uh, China's GDP is certain to surpass that of the United States. And uh, <clears throat> this is a projection of GDP growth with conservative uh, assumptions. Uh, and you'll see, according to these assumptions here, you can see the uh, assumptions for growth, inflation, uh, currency appreciation. Uh, 2019 is the year that uh, China's GDP should surpass that of the United States. And because of the difference in growth rate, you'll see that the gap widens very quickly after that. Military spending is another uh, measure of, of, of power. Now, this measures, this looks at spending uh, by countries, selected countries from 2000 to 2012. Now, think back on that decade. This was a decade when the U.S. got involved in two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, uh, spending in this decade rose, uh, 275 billion, as, as a percentage of the base at, from the beginning of 2000. That's a 70% increase. Uh, quite a bit, but of course, we were talking about two wars uh, being financed. Uh, if you look at China, chi in absolute numbers, China uh, grows a little less than half of that of the United States. However, in percentage terms, uh, from the base of, of, of the beginning of the period, uh, it grows 325% at a time when China is secure. Nobody's threatening its security. Uh, nobody you know, doesn't face any, any imminent threats. Uh, and so clearly there's some kind of agenda uh, driving this, this vigorous growth. Now despite its successes, uh, China is still unhappy. You would think that after you know, this wonderful rise, it would be happy and you know, very satisfied with itself, but it's not. It's very unhappy today. And uh, you see here, this is, I take this image from uh, the Global Times, and it's a very carefully constructed image. And I think it captures very well the way China feels about the situation in East Asia. Um, China meaning the, the, the regime in Beijing. You see here China here. He's fighting uh, over these uh, cakes. Uh, now, of course, uh, she's wearing a kimono. You could best guess who, who that represents. That would be Japan the, in the East China Sea. And of course, down here, you have the Philippines and Vietnam fighting over a cake, the South China Sea. All right. And <clears throat> you see here, South Korea is pushing another cake onto the, into the ring to fight over. You see here, India is climbing into the ring <laughs> to start to fight. Right? Russia is looking on with great interest. Australia here is happy because uh, they're going to be selling lots of resources to China. <laughs> the, you know, here you see Kim Jong-un firing his missiles very happily. Um, Type A and Mongolia are watching from the sideline. Here's Pakistan, of course, China's one enthusiastic ally. Um, the others, these people of in Indochina, these uh, Indochinese countries here, Thailand, Myanmar, Cambodia, 
Uh, they don't care. It doesn't involve them. And in the background here, of course, is the United States pulling the strings. <coughs> now, you see here the, the blue dots, um, or the, the countries with the blue, uh, uh, with names in the uh, blue, blue type. Those would be U.S. allies. With the exception of Singapore, all these alliances were forged in the wake of the Cold War, or, or during the Cold War. And they still exist today uh, in the wake of the Cold War. Uh, on the Chinese side, according to the, the report that uh, this, uh, this image comes from, um, they reckon North Korea to be a, an ally of China, and Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia to be somewhat sort of aligned or leaning toward China. We could argue about those assumptions. Now, um, the U.S. pivots to Asia in 2011. Uh, the, the landmark, I guess, uh, of this pivot is Obama's visit to the Australian Parliament in November 2011. He says the United States is a Pacific power, you know, here to stay. And uh, as we end today's wars, that is the wars in Afghanistan and, our, and, and, and Iraq, uh, what he's saying is that uh, there will be no reduction of this defense spending in the Asia Pacific. And in fact, there will be a rebalancing uh, that uh, the U.S. will begin to pay more strategic attention to the situation in, in, in East Asia. The economic aspect of this pivot is the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. Uh, it's a, it's a post-WTO. It's a, it's a more uh, enhanced version of, of trade and economic liberalization, uh, which, by the way, excludes China. And um, there is supposed to be a regional diplomatic strategy uh, to knit all this together. However, uh, it, it hasn't been too evident uh, recently. But here's, uh, I think, what really concerns China, and that is uh, the Pentagon strategic guidance of uh, January 2012, uh, this whole concept of air-sea battle. You see here <coughs> the assumption behind this, uh, behind this plan is that uh, if China control, in a conflict situation, if China grabs control strategically of this area inside this red dotted line, the way the U.S. would try to come back would be to uh, uh, use its bases to, um, to absorb a first strike and, and, and try, to, try to come back. It's actually um, a very controversial strategy. I don't, I don't really want to talk about it too much. However, uh, what what it does, what's troubling about this whole uh, strategic situation is that both sides are getting to be sort of um, coming to a hair trigger uh, sort of confrontation. Because uh, in these strategies, whoever strikes first has an advantage. So it's, it's very troubling. Now, China, because China is a newly risen great power, uh, it believes that it deserves uh, to have uh, certain, uh, certain prerogatives, certain rights and prerogatives. Uh, of course, most important would be a regional order uh, to its own liking. Basically, uh, China wants rights and privileges equal to the U.S. Now, and this reflects uh, very realist, structural realist thinking. Um, According to this way of thinking, a great power has the right to shape international order, and of course that right is based on power. And uh, in the balance of power thinking, uh, a great power has, uh, uh, well, you would naturally expect a great power to have dominance, strategic dominance in its own home region. So does China want to revise the present order uh, is, is the question. And the answer is uh, going to be determined by, of course, the balance of power as well as domestic factors. Now here you'll see uh, defense spending in the Asia Pacific, a projection from 2011 to 2015. This is done by IHS Jane's uh, defense consultancy. And you'll see here that uh, <coughs> China is estimate, China's military spending is estimated to um, to grow from about 120 uh, billion to about 230, uh, 38 billion dollars uh, by 2015. If you add up 
the military spending of all the other countries in Asia, that's Japan, India, South Korea, Australia, Taiwan, Singapore, Indonesia, and so on, uh, this number is bigger than all the rest put together. Now here is a, uh, uh, an image of the representation of the so-called two island chains. Uh, these, are, these island chains are, according to Chinese maritime strategists, of vital interest to China and to China's security. Uh, <coughs> the uh, Admiral Liu Huaqing, uh, back in the 1980s, uh, in the late 80s, had a vision for the Chinese Navy its, its, its mission, its ultimate mission, would be to control the space within these island chains. Um, within uh, the first island chain here, uh, coming from Japan, uh, on the outside of Taiwan, and encompassing the South China Sea, uh, by uh, roughly 2010. Now, uh, how is uh, China actually acting to, to realize this control, and how is it doing it? Uh, Roughly speaking, using uh, fishing fleets as a vanguard, kind of a paramilitary vanguard to occupy zones and uh, backed up by military force, that is, to defend them. Uh, Taiwan, uh, China also, of course, uh, with, its, with its military development, is, uh, seeks to control Taiwan's fate. The second island chain, uh, there's no publicly announced timeline, but many people reckon, according to the timeline that seems to be in their minds, it would be something like 2025. The approach that China takes toward this region is called uh, active defense, TG Fang Yu. Uh, Americans, the Pentagon calls it A2AD, area access, area denial. The idea is to um, uh, conduct normal operations within this area, patrols, and in the event of conflict, uh, deny any enemy access to this zone. Now, here are some uh, ter here are, uh, territorial conflicts in the surrounding seas, the East China Sea and the South China Sea. The dotted line here uh, in the Yellow Sea and into the uh, East China Sea is China's claim, and the solid line is South Korea's claim. You see in the middle here is this uh, it's not actually even an islet, it's a submerged rock. And it might even be funny, you know, uh, except <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> but it might even be funny because to make it visible, the South Koreans have actually uh, sunk steel pillars into it and erected a, a structure that actually sticks out of the water. And the Koreans say, that's ours. And the Chinese say, no, that's not. That's ours. It's in our zone. Um, here in the East China Sea, uh, this line, of course, is uh, the, the extent claimed from the China coastline outward. Uh, this line here is the line claimed by Japan, extending outward from the Ryukyu Islands. This is a, consists of five island groupings. One of the island groupings is a Sankaku island grouping, which would be uh, right, right here. <coughs> this, by the way, uh, are gas fields the Chinese have begun uh, producing from there. In the South China Sea, uh, you see here this red line represents <coughs> the so-called uh, Nine Dash Line. Uh, that line uh, is, um, uh, the area within that line is claimed by China as its, its territory. Now, uh, the line is not based on any uh, international legal norm because according to present uh, norms, uh, uh, First of all, as far as maritime rights are concerned, it has to extend from land features where people can actually live permanently. Uh, and these little islets here uh, don't really uh, support human habitation. So if you did it according to international legal uh, norms, uh, China's EEZ would be limited to this, probably this area. <coughs> as far as sovereignty is concerned, China says, uh, we remember, historically, we remember this area to be ours. And so it's ours. Uh, of course, the thing is about memory is tricky. People, you know, uh, 
The surrounding countries uh, remember this area to be theirs too. <laughs> you know, so it's a bit of an issue. The, the, the other lines you see here represent the uh, EEZ claims of, of the littoral countries around the sea. And you can see it's kind of a mess. It, uh, now, it should be an issue that is, uh, because of its nature, that should be, it should be um, negotiated multilaterally, really, to, to work it out properly. However, uh, China has backed away from its previous position uh, of 2002 when it said it would discuss this issue with ASEAN multilaterally. Now China says it will not. It will only discuss uh, these conflicts with neighbors individually on a bilateral basis. I'm not going to talk about that area, the India, Indian border issues. This here <coughs> shows the, uh, so the, the, the Chinese claimed uh, 80s, the um, air defense identification zone. Uh, you can see that the zone claimed by China or uh, asserted or imposed uh, covers the air airspace over the disputed Senkaku or Diaoyu Islands, which would be right here. It, um, <clears throat> now, what's peculiar about this 80s is that, unlike other 80s, uh, it's uh, planes that are just passing through, not bound to China, are supposed to uh, contact PLA air traffic controllers and get directions from them as to how to proceed. Uh, if they don't, they're subject to interception. So that means if you're on a flight from Seoul, let's say to Taiwan, uh, you have to report in to a PLA air traffic controller. And um, that is, uh, uh, or be subject to, to possible uh, military um, surveillance or interception. Now, uh, Xi Jinping's Chinese dream <clears throat> Here we're getting to uh, how China thinks about itself, its future, its relationship with the outside world. Uh, many people say that uh, it's unclear what the Chinese dream is. However, if you look at the official media, it's pretty clear what it is. Uh, it's uh, complete the building of a moderately prosperous society by 2020, the, the 100th birthday of the Communist Party. By the 100th birthday of the PRC, it's a modern socialist country that's prosperous, strong, democratic, culturally advanced, and harmonious. The word, use of the word democratic is peculiar. Uh, I, I think what it means is that uh, they expect China to be so su obviously successful that Chinese society will, the, that is the people, will, will just will agree. There will be no need actually for, for formal votes or anything. They will just by a claim say, yes, the Communist Party succeeded, we're all happy. Then China will work to realize the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. So what that seems to mean is after 2049, uh, we're going to see a new era of global predominance or preeminence, uh, preeminence, not predominance, preeminence uh, by China. China again becomes a middle kingdom. Uh, surrounded by an international normative order, more to China's liking. What's interesting about Xi Jinping is his neo, what I would call his neo-traditionalism. His very, very traditional ways of thinking. Um, he seeks a, a great power sphere for China, which is kind of a 19th century Bismarckian sort of balance of power way of approaching things. Uh, with respect to Asia, he seeks something called a community of common destiny. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, it's a rather hierarchical, sinocentric concept run by bilateral relationships, inherently unequal because of China's size relative to its neighbors. It's going, it's, uh, this, this community will not be governed by objective law, uh, binding uh, everybody uniformly to rules. It'll be governed by reward and punishment. Uh, and it's, it's, it sort of reminds you uh, of uh, a more traditional order, the Tianxia order uh, of Chinese uh, pre-modern history, uh, where you had this sinocentric, sort of hierarchical, bilaterally managed system. Of course, em the, the, uh, the emblematic uh, system would be the, the, the tribute system uh, in, in ancient China. 
The other, uh, uh, another interesting sort of neo-traditional aspect is harking back to Confucian norms. Uh, that is, those norms that fit norms the CCP would like uh, to, to see reinforced. Uh, absolute power by the ruler, the Tens are the, are the son of heaven. A centralized hierarchy uh, that, governs, uh, that governs the nation. Uh, not the rule of law, but moral principles interpreted by a, by a bureaucracy. Uh, people have obligations, more obligations rather than individual rights. And collectivism or harmony uh, is, is, is the goal is the goal, not, not the achievement of individual interests. Xi Jinping wants a new kind of great power relationship uh, between the US and China. What does this mean? This is the language of structural realism again. Uh, whenever you talk about great powers, uh, that, that's, that's, that's a, a real signal. Um, again, the language of real politic might makes right. Uh, the key here is this notion of bipolarity, where there are two great powers in the world who between them can manage things, if only they can cooperate. Uh, also uh, in, uh, wrapped into this concept is this notion of a hegemonic cycle. That is, uh, in history, you see the rise and decline of powers. And of course, when a rising power meets the declining power, often bad things happen, like, like wars. Not always, but, but, but often enough. Uh, and so the idea is that the U.S. and China should have a win-win relationship. That is, uh, <clears throat> given, the, given the, this history of conflict between rising powers and declining powers, of course, you can t guess which power is which. Uh, the U.S. and China should cooperate to avoid conflict, manage uh, a peaceful decline, and manage a successful rise by China. Uh, wrapped up in this uh, whole notion is that maybe the U.S. should think about conceding uh, predominance in Asia to, uh, to China. Uh, trust China to manage things in East Asia uh, in a way that will benefit everybody. Now, with respect to uh, Asia, uh, China has this co uh, concept now of the community of common destiny, the Mingyun Gongtong Ti in Asia. Uh, this really comes out in the work conference uh, on diplomacy toward the periphery that happened toward the end of October. Uh, the, the, the whole tone of this conference and the thinking, uh, the statements that come out of it is a confidence that China's predominance in the region is inevitable. Uh, their Chinese policy toward the region seems to be guided by new aims and principles. In other words, uh, the, the whole notion that Deng Xiaoping pushed that that um, China's diplomacy should be very modest, don't seek leadership, don't seek attention, don't be pushy, uh, seems to be uh, gone. There seems to be a new assertiveness, a new confidence, um, even military assertiveness. Apparently, uh, according to some reports, uh, uh, Xi Jinping, um, in discussing the, uh, discussed the 80s and, and, and asserted that um, China has to be more <coughs> proactive in, in, in asserting itself in that um, conflicts like the Diaoyu Dao, the Senkaku issues, not now, no more just about fish, it's no more just about gas, it's about big, important, long-term strategic issues. Now, what are some of the um, uh, principles that will be underlying this new approach? First of all, no compromising uh, China's core interests. Uh, every leader, every Chinese leader when he grows about always says this. Uh, another thing uh, that's often said by the leaders uh, addressing their own military is we must prepare to win local wars. In terms of uh, diplomacy, uh, hub and spoke bilateralism uh, is, is going to be the hallmark of managing this region. Uh, the idea is to use, uh, the, code, the, the code word they use is reciprocity, but what this means is really using carrots and sticks. The idea is if you, if you cooperate with us, we'll cooperate with you. If you don't cooperate with us, 
we can make life difficult for you. <laughs> so it's this sort of, this is reciprocity uh, in, in, in managing this region. As far as the relevance of international law is concerned, it depends on whether or not international law coincides with China's core interests. Uh, if China's core interests dictate uh, a different rule for resolving disputes or, or, or governing behavior, China's core interests will, win, will win out. Now, what are these core interests? Uh, first of all, um, we have to be clear what core interest means here. Uh, core interests in the Chinese uh, vocabulary seem to be equivalent to the U.S. vital interest. A vital interest is an interest that a country is, uh, believes is worth fighting for. Now, the thing about uh, core interest or vital interest is that the more powerful you get, the more vital interest you get, right? Because you can afford to fight more battles because you, and you can expect to win more. So as China's power increases, you can expect to see its core interests uh, begin to incrementally grow. So fir first, first, the U.S. must accommodate China as a strategic equal. This is the new kind of great power uh, relationship. Uh, Asia belongs to China's natural sphere of influence. This is the community of common destiny. China uh, today is pushing its borders outward to the first island chain extending its control in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. Uh, and of course, it's renewing its claims on, the, on, the, on its border with India. China has been signaling its desire for strategic predominance in Asia. Uh, the, uh, the incident in 2009 with the USS Impeccable, uh, US uh, intelligence gathering ship in international waters was, was stopped by some Chinese vessels um, that was uh, unprecedented confrontation. In 2012, uh, China begins direct challenges to the sovereignty of U.S. allies. This would be the Philippines and Japan. Scarborough Shoal in the, in the Philippines, or Huangyandao, Senkaku Islands, or Diaoyudao in Japan. In position of the 80s, in November of 2013, the Kaupins incident, which was a, a guided missile cruiser, which was shadowing that, that aircraft carrier that you saw earlier at the beginning of the presentation, uh, was stopped in its tracks by a ship that cut across its bow and stopped. Uh, the commentary in the Global Times was, if the US doesn't like it, it can just leave the region. Uh, of course, in December, uh, China declares um, that uh, fishing in the South China Sea, for most of the South China Sea, presumably within the, within the nine dash line, is under Chinese jurisdiction. Any, any boats fishing there that are not Chinese can suffer uh, arrest, confiscation, uh, and so on. Now, <clears throat> what does this seem to mean? Uh, Eric Lee, who some of you may have read his stuff. He's been very active in leading opinion journals in the United States, explaining China's rise, explaining what it means. And these are his words. Um, China's strategic objective in the region is to change the status quo, establishment of which it did not have enough power to participate in or to influence, to its advantage without resulting in actual military conflicts. In other words, the present international system is not something that China played a part in shaping. It happened to China. And now that China's a great power, uh, it feels as though it has the right to begin to alter, to impose norms that it feels more comfortable with. China does not and probably never will subscribe to the universal ideology of democratic liberalism. Now this, of course, is the CCP position. If you talk to Chinese in Taiwan or in elsewhere in Asia, they might not agree with this. However, certainly this is the, this is the view of the regime of the regime in Beijing. Uh, finally, its vibrant market economy is pointedly not capitalism. In other words, uh, it's socialism with Chinese characteristics. So convergence with the West is not part of the plan here. Now, uh, <coughs> now we get to this whole uh, uh, issue of Japan. 
so long as Japan is a U.S. ally, uh, it, and given China's agenda, it needs to be isolated and excluded from China's Asian order. Uh, my contention is that if Japan were to uh, leave the alliance with the United States and accommodate China's core interests, we wouldn't be seeing uh, these historical issues. We wouldn't be seeing uh, conflicts. And the Chinese Navy would be in Okinawa. <laughs> yes, and, and everything would be very harmonious. So uh, what's happening in the Sino-Japanese relationship is a function of China's rise and, um, uh, against American predominance and the alliance that the U.S. has with Japan. Now China's uh, approach toward Japan takes an interesting U-turn in the 2008 to 2010 period. I'm only doing a snapshot of this U-turn. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, U-turn. May 2008, there's a Sino-Japanese summit, a joint statement on all-around promotion of strategic and, and mutually beneficial relations. No sense of dispute or, uh, or, or hard feelings or conflict in this. Uh, in June 2008, agreement on joint development in the East China Sea. This was heralded at the time as being a landmark agreement where both countries are going to be able to peacefully resolve the differences, cooperate for their mutual benefit and prosperity. However, in 2008-2009, we have the Wall Street crisis. And uh, uh, this seems to have affected uh, uh, Chinese thinking about its relationship with the U.S. and its, uh, its place in the world, it, it's, it seems to have convinced the leadership that the United States was on an accelerated path of decline and that uh, China's rise uh, relative to the U.S. is going to be that much faster. And so it, it became a little more assertive in how it was going to deal with Japan and with the United States. September 2010, a Chinese fishing vessel rams a Japanese Coast Guard vessel near the disputed islands. Uh, the captain is arrested. Uh, it, this creates this massive uh, media campaign in China, internationally as well as domestically, denouncing Japan, uh, demanding apologies, uh, canceling all high-level meetings. Uh, there are uh, street protests so all over in Chinese cities, and China stops rare earth exports to Japan. Uh, and this really marks the beginning of this current period of anti-Japanese struggle in domestic and international propaganda. Now, uh, what are the methods of this campaign? First of all, use history as a mirror. In other words, when we look at Japan, we don't look at Japan today. We look at pre-war Japan when Japan was invading China. That's the Japan we're dealing with. We're not looking at Japan as it is actually today. Criticized visits to Yasukuni Shrine. This shows that Japan is unrepentant. It worships war criminals. It also shows that Japan, uh, Japanese militarism is an active threat. The Japanese are just, just raring to go. Uh, make a historical claim to, this, to the Diaoyuda or Senkaku Islands. Um, however, if you look at maps, um, Chinese maps, PRC maps from 1950 to 1969 or 70, these islands are not called Diaoyudao. They're called Senkaku. They're marked as Japanese islands. Now, you can't get the foreign ministry to open up its archives to look at its maps uh, because it would be very inconvenient to, to reveal this fact. Then, of course, war scares over the, over the islands. Uh, and then, of course, when Japan resists, uh, condemn Japan for resisting. Now, why is China doing this? First, uh, China ha Japan has to be excluded as a model for China. Japan is an advanced democracy, uh, not an appropriate model uh, for, for China. Uh, Japan instead becomes a lightning rod for latent uh, popular anger and frustration. If you go to China and live there, uh, as I do, you see that nobody is happy. There's a lot of floating uh, anger. Even rich people are unhappy. They're not happy with the way things are. Um, condemning Japan and using history as a mirror also reminds the Chinese people of how the CCP defeated Japan and saved China. You know, it wasn't the U.S. that defeated Japan. You know, it was the CCP. Also, um, it helps to divide Japan from its Western allies. 
by reminding uh, the West that Japan was once your enemy and China was your friend. Uh, it, specifically, it undermines the U.S.-Japan alliance because the U.S. does not want to fight over a bunch of rocks. Right? Whereas uh, Japan views this as being a part of its, its, its sovereign right. So that creates tension. And finally, discredit Japan and Asia. Uh, China can uh, more easily uh, dominate Asia minus Japan. Now, September 2012 is the peak of the dispute. Uh, the timing is very interesting because uh, it coincides with uh, Defense Secretary Panetta visiting Tokyo and Beijing to explain the so-called pivot. Um, <coughs> Uh, confronted with this, uh, with the escalation of tension uh, around the Senkakus, uh, Panetta was forced to clarify. Basically, uh, what, he, what, he, what he said is that uh, the U.S. will not defend the Senkakus. However, if Japan is attacked, uh, then the U.S. will, will, will respond. Now, during this whole crisis, the LDP had to choose a new leader. And uh, it chose uh, Abe Shinzo. And this is a curious choice because Abe Shinzo had been prime minister in 2006 to 2007, and he was a failure. He led the LDP into an upper house election that the, that the LDP lost. He lost control of the upper house. It was a humiliating defeat. Subsequently, he resigned. The only reason, I believe, the only reason why they brought him back is because he was the only person, because of his right-wing views, because he's, you know, he's just bound and determined to change the alliance, uh, to, to uh, enhance collective security, and to revise the constitution to make Japan a normal country, so to speak. And he really believes in it. Uh, and he's probably the only senior leader in the LDP that believes in this. They brought him back. And so he's the guy who's going to do this. And I think they're doing this <laughs> while he's doing it. But um, I think absent, absent the tension uh, over, over the Aoyudao Islands in 2012, I don't think he would have been leading uh, Japan today. Now, what's at stake for Japan? First of all, national sovereignty, obviously. Secondly, comprehensive security. Uh, the US-Japan alliance is threatened uh, by this uh, confrontation. International rule of law, that is, uh, will disputes, territorial disputes or disputes between nations be resolved by law or is, will it be resolved by force? Uh, Japan's brand image. Uh, you know, Japan and China, of course, all nations, they think more about soft power. Uh, Japan is very uh, worried that uh, China's active uh, media campaigns to tarnish Japan's image um, will be successful. And of course, ultimately, this will hurt Japan's overseas investment and trade. Uh, obviously, it affects Japan's international standing as a leader in Asia and its desire for a stronger role in global governance, for example, in the UN Security Council. Now, what is Japan doing to counter this? Obviously, it's enhancing its military capabilities. It's changed its military doctrine to something called active deterrence. Um, which seeks to uh, meet uh, low-scale aggression that normally would be below the level, below the threshold of a military response. Japan is going to be responding to these things now. Strengthen uh, the alliance with the United States. Uh, so what Abe is emphasizing is collective defense, closer integration with the military uh, uh, to, to um, Two steps forward in this would be the Designated Secrets Act, which is very controversial in Japan, but which the U U.S. requires for closer, closer defense uh, cooperation. And also a resolution of Okinawa base issues. There's been progress on that. And then uh, active global diplomacy. You'll, you'll, you will have noticed that Abe is very active on the global scene. Uh, Abe is not getting hung up, hung up over China and, and, and South Korea. His view is, if they don't want to talk to me, fine. No talk, no resolution of these issues, but I'm not going to stop diplomacy. And so he's, he's going talking to everybody else except for China and South Korea now. 
So he's um, uh, taking new regional initiatives, reaching out to ASEAN, for example. He's, uh, he's trying to build values-based relationships. These are relationships built on common values like democracy and a renewed emphasis on ODA, official development assistance. Uh, you can see that with respect to the U.S. alliance, uh, he's uh, growing the defense budget uh, after it had declined for 13 years. Now, the growth is, is modest, uh, only 5% only over the next five years. Nevertheless, it's growth. Uh, he names a new cabinet legislation bureau head to, to manage the change in, this, uh, in Japan's approach toward collective defense, organizes a national security council, holds a new uh, two plus two meeting. That's a meeting between the defense and the um, uh, secretary of state of the US with the, with the defense minister and the ministry of foreign affairs of Japan to come up with a, a, a revised bilateral defense guidelines to meet new threats. This is specifically designed to deal with um, Senkaku Island type scenarios. And Okinawa based issues move forward. Now, this conflict between Japan and China over the islands is, is, is very significant because uh, armed conflict between uh, these two countries will bring the U.S. into war with China, obviously, because of the alliance. Uh, we also see today between uh, Japan and China escalating mutual antipathy. Uh, the security dilemma is escalating, that is, with increased mistrust and dislike. Uh, coupled with rising military budgets, growing military capabilities, uh, it's sharpening the security dilemma. The overlap of PLA and SDF military patrols and missions over, over the disputed islands increases the risk of accident and miscalculation leading to war. Uh, now, the U.S. has been, until very, very recently, has been sort of neutral and ambiguous over its position in this dispute between Japan and China. And uh, what this does is it raises doubts in Japan uh, regarding the reliability of the US. And then of course, this makes Japan feel less secure, which is not good for domestic stability, right? Uh, because uh, then a whole range of possibilities opens up. And um, I, I don't think in a, in a volatile situation like this, you want, to encourage, you want to encourage this. It also encourages China to push for further gains. If, the, if China sees the U.S. is not really taking sides, it just says, oh, well, there's more opportunities here. Well, let's push a little more. Now, uh, it's clear that uh, what's driving this uh, conflict is China's revisionist ambitions. Uh, desire to achieve Chinese regional predominance, uh, uh, weaken and isolate Japan. In other words, this island dispute is very useful for educating Japan in its interests in this new era of Chinese predominance. Right? Uh, China has, uh, Japan has to be instructed that if you want to uh, secure your real interests, you're going to have to deal with China, not the United States. And this island dispute is useful for this. Uh, and finally, of course, China wants to control the island chains, establish the A2, uh, A2AD sphere, a secure new Asian order. As I said, the U.S. has tried to be even-handed um, for all the reasons that I list here. Um, uh, but at the same time, the U.S. pivot seeks to strengthen existing defense relationships and build new ones. Uh, there's a little bit of a contradiction here because if if, J if Japan and the Philippines believes that the U.S. is not a reliable partner, it's not going to be able to strengthen these relationships and, and create new ones. Uh, uh, the U.S. seems to be hoping that China will just learn to appreciate the benefits of the status quo, give up this revisionist agenda. But as I just mentioned earlier, this, uh, this, this whole policy or strategy of ambiguity and even-handedness only encourages instability. Uh, China sees weakness and opportunity. Japan sees U.S. abandonment and uh, leading to, to panic. Now, uh, 
China has been very successful, I think, in uh, advancing its sphere of control in the East China Sea and South China Sea um, without triggering a U.S. response. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, China's been using uh, official civilian forces like Coast Guard, maritime patrol vessels, and these kinds of things to seize actual control of territories and EEZs claimed by U.S. allies and friends. Uh, and of course, these actions remain below the threshold of U.S. military alliance commitments. So China, in other words, uh, it's kind of a hall pass. It's a free pass to, to keep doing this. And violating the norms, particularly uh, law of the sea norms, carries no consequences for, for China, apparently, because the China's counterparts, that is, the, the countries with whom China has th these disputes, are small, uh, relatively powerless. They're, there's nothing they can do. So neighbors lose territory, wealth, and confidence in the U.S. commitments uh, as this process goes on. And uh, I, I believe the thinking is that as China advances, uh, the U.S. will lose the desire and ability to confront China. So what can the U.S. do? Well, obviously, the U.S. is not going to tr uh, choose armed confrontation. Neither side has an interest in this. Uh, the U.S. might consider, uh, you know, considering China's uh, agenda and agreeing to it. You know, why not concede to Asia to Chinese governance? It, it avoids war, right? It preserves friendly relations with China. The U.S. can adjust to a bipolar world again. Uh, uh, however, the U.S. pays uh, great costs, immense costs for this. Uh, there's a there's a third choice, and that is to defend existing interests, uh, assets, and norms in Asia. Um, I believe this is the best choice because, first of all, China's future rise is not assured. Uh, secondly, China, uh, China also has no interest in starting a war with the United States. China has a, a vested interest in peace and stability and continued uh, good relations with neighbors. Uh, it's doubtful that China will, will want to go so far as to start a war uh, in order to uh, convince the U.S. and its allies that, that they must break their relationships. And finally, I think most importantly for the United States is that China's neighbors will help the U.S. stay in Asia. Uh, they don't want to be dominated by China. They don't want to be dominated by any single country. Their interests are secured if there are many larger powers balancing each other in the region. So uh, the U.S. strategy has to, I think, take this into account and, um, and build on it. China can be forced to pay higher costs for violating accepted international norms without incurring uh, strategic risk. In other words, uh, y you know, y you can, you can um, the U.S. can support uh, other countries in the regions in their uh, territorial disputes with China. Uh, but of course, these issues aren't, aren't going to um, uh, create a risk for actual conflict or war between the U.S. and China. Uh, the problem, of course, is that current U.S. policy really isn't doing the job. It's, it's not doing this. This, 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 this even-handedness and this ambiguity, I think, are not really uh, not really working, and um, I, so for that reason, I believe the sense that I get just looking at the news uh, of the last two or three weeks is that uh, the U.S. seems to be changing its attitude to, uh, and it's is being a little more partisan in these disputes that involve China and its neighbors. <laughs>